you and thank thanks for everyone's patience can everyone hear me can everyone see me yeah yeah, we're good. yeah. yay <laughs> So, yeah, I think a, a fantastic range of, of talks for you guys today. So I'm going to talk about biological sciences. Um, I've always loved them. Um, biology has always been my favourite subject. Um, never was quite sure what I wanted to do with it, whether I wanted to carry on and do medicine or science. So also suffered chemistry and physics and maths all the way through to the end of what would be your hires and then did a biochemistry degree at university first and then went on to do the thing that I really fell in love with, which was a PhD in immunology. So really studying how the immune system, our defense against infection, against cancer, actually works in health and disease so totally totally fell in love with that you may or may not have seen a bit of a video about the technology that i've always studied but now we work on to generate new medicines within nova biotics um, but i can tell you a little bit more about um, the kind of medicines that that we make here um, and really how the immune system fights infection when we have a functioning immune system is the basis of, of how we make our drugs. And ironically, the reason I can't be with you today is I've been taking a very good friend of mine in for some cancer treatment. It's also World Cancer Day today, the 20th anniversary of it. But the thing that is affecting her the most, believe it or not, is not the cancer at the moment. It's not her chemotherapy. It's a fungal infection because the treatment that you have, even the steroids, really weakens your immune system and makes you really prone to infection. So you might not be able to see the pop-up behind me, but one of the treatments we're developing, you know, you probably think of infection as something that you can go and get a course of antibiotics via the GP for, but infection affects so many things and it's a growing problem of medicine because as we're getting much better at being able to treat and manage cancer, the immune system is struggling, so you are more prone to infection in those circumstances. And driving it even closer to home, we also have um, an ex-member of staff of ours who worked on this program to tackle infections associated with cancer treatment. And she also has the, the same cancer, so she's struggling with this as well. Um, knows we have lots of good stuff in the fridge that probably will work, but it's got to go through some clinical trials and, and tests first. So I'm sure you're all aware and have all read about and, and understand the basics of resistance to antibacterial therapies and also antifungal therapies. It's a massive, massive problem. Um, we simply are not going to have enough antibacterials and antifungals to combat infection full stop, but certainly infection that is now resistant to our existing choice of medicines. And that's just because we've probably taken antibiotics for granted far too much since they were first discovered in the 1940s. Um, so we've overused them. Um, we probably use them when we didn't necessarily need to. So example, for a viral infection, they're very, very precious drugs, but we probably not realized how precious they are. So we're now faced with really needing the kind of medicines that, that we're developing here that will hopefully be on the market in the not too distant future. And there are fantastic other companies in the UK and worldwide also developing these kind of treatments for bacterial infections, for fungal infections, with coronavirus that you've heard about on the news as well. There's no vaccine for that. Um, there's no treatment for that. Again, all of these emerging infections are such a, a major problem. Um, but we still need lots of microbiologists, lots of immunologists. Um, where we're different again is the fact that we're harnessing how the body fights infection because it's learned to do so in a way that doesn't create resistance and also in a way that works against resistance bugs. So, you know, why reinvent the wheel? Work on what nature's developed brilliantly over eons of evolution and translate that biology with some chemistry 
into some new therapy um, and that's what we do at Nova Biotics. So we have a, a range of, of therapies in development, not just for fungal infections and those um, associated with microbiologists here um, doing that. And we have some that are more advanced and actually already in late stage clinical trials um, up and down Scotland, all over the world, and you know, in some cases, benefiting patients already, which is fantastic. Um, a couple of other points that I was going to come up on. I think that the reason you know we've been successful so far is you know the word novel or new or first in class. We're not developing. A different form of the antibiotics you're probably aware of. These will be completely new drugs. So there's obviously a lot of testing to do, a lot of work before those actually will get on the market. But hopefully it's not going to be too far in the distance. There are all sorts of incentives, as you'd imagine, that governments, that regulators are putting in place at the moment to help fast track these therapies. Um, so it's an exciting time for us. Um, and I guess for me, after doing my PhD, the reason I guess I'm where I am now in a very different setting, in a, in a commercial setting, I was lucky enough to go and work in, in America for a while. And then I spent some time in Belgium, um, had a fantastic time learning a lot more about the immune system, how it's regulated, how again it works in health and disease. So I did a lot of time as a as a bench scientist and then I moved up here to Aberdeen to take up an academic role. I wasn't really supposed to start a business, that, that wasn't the plan, but had the opportunity to really develop this idea that had always been in the back of my mind about making new medicines engineered against how the body fights its infection. So I had the chance to do that starting from 2002, but as you've heard from 2004, actually started the business so day to day i guess I, I get the best of both worlds i obviously still use my science training 24 7 that's at the core of, of what we do if you now look at the chief execs of some of the bigger biotechs and this is now happening in the pharmaceutical industry they're not accountants they're not generic business people they are medics and scientists. Um, there are more women coming through and we have a bit of a gender imbalance in Aberdeen because we have very, very few male CEOs of our biotech companies. It's, it's nearly all female leaders, which is great. So I think that science training is essential, but I now apply that in a business setting and it's all about the business of translating the immunology, developing those new drugs from how the body fights infection, and the pathway of, of translating that into new medicines that will then, you know, hopefully reach patients in not too distant future, and also at the same time, obviously, make the business a success. So that success can be reinvested into yet more medicines for the future. So hopefully that was clear. You've also seen a bit of the, the animation of what our antimicrobials do versus standard ones and how they can kill drug resistant organisms where the standard antibiotics in the case of bacteria that you'll be familiar with won't actually work. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. I'm sure we can make this work if you've been able to, to hear me for the last few minutes. Great. Thank you, Deborah. We've not actually seen your film, but I'm going to show the film after we've had some questions in case the line goes down. Great. So, uh, questions for Deborah? Yes, there's a hand up over here. You've got to wait for the uh, microphone to move, Deborah. Hang on a minute. And it's getting chucked about the place. Here we go. How do you know what medicines or drugs to give? Um, so, like, so that they like get better and stuff. Did you get that question, Deborah? How do you know what drugs to give them so they'll get better? That's a great question. 
So what you need is to work out what the infection is in the first place. And that is such a good question when it comes to anti-infectives, because another reason that we have the issue of antibiotic resistance is giving somebody the wrong drug in the first place and then they don't need it, their body's been exposed to it, they become resistant when actually they needed another antibiotic. So what you have to do is diagnose them first of all. That can be really tricky for fungal infections because you would need to take a blood sample or a tissue sample, um, grow the organism. In the case of bacteria, you'll hopefully know in 24 hours what it is. With fungus, it can take a couple of days, even longer, and that's assuming that you were lucky and you got a good sample containing the, the organism in the first place. The difference, and obviously that's very important because there's a window where you want to be able to treat somebody as soon as possible, but you know, your question, you want to make sure you're giving them the right thing. What's different about biotics treatments is they work in such a way as you can give them, how we'd say, empirically. So they're safe enough to give before you even know what the infection is. So if a patient has all the symptoms of a bacterial infection, so they have a fever, um, you can at least culture something that you know is bacterial or do a very rapid test to at least suggest that there is bacteria there. Our drugs are so broad spectrum that it's actually safe to use them even before you know exactly what it is. And it's the same with our antifungal. So these new classes of what are still called non-traditional antimicrobials are very important because they can be used that way. So provided that you do know a patient has an infection and you don't need to narrow it down to exactly what, and therefore also potentially lose valuable time in a treatment window to get a new medicine into them. And as much as there is actually a push, not that it's something Novobiotics does, um, there is a big push at the moment for better diagnostics and diagnostics that use a lot of molecular biology. So rather than actually growing something and doing old fashioned microbiology, you'll be able to take a sample from a patient and look very quickly at what it is and even go a step further and use a diagnostic test to see if there's any resistance genes in that organism that also would preclude you from necessarily using a particular class of drug if you know that bug is already resistant to it. So the diagnostics do go hand in hand with existing classes of, of antimicrobials so we can use them more appropriately. But for lots of new classes of drugs like ours, it's not so important. And, and the, the key to us is being able to get these drugs into patients much more quickly. Thank that was you. a great question. Thanks, Deborah. Any other questions? Yes, one down here at the front. Okay. Catch it. Don't have okay. So, it. <laughs> Hang on. Here we go. Right. Here we go. Right. Oh. How do you test your drugs to make sure they're safe for use? How do you test your drugs, Deborah, to make sure they're safe? Brilliant question again. So we can do lots of things in the labs, which are just through the, the doors here, where we look at, at cells taken from human bodies, from the lung, from the colon, from the liver, in some industry standard tests where you will, once you know something's active against the bacteria or the fungi, we'll check that it doesn't actually kill isolated human cells and we keep those in liquid nitrogen nice and safe and secure or we can get them out and thaw them when we need them do those initial safety tests for peptides one of our classes of drugs they can sometimes burst red blood cells as well so we'll also do some tests just to check that there's no what they call hemolysis so those are the the first two steps and we can do all of those in the lab what the law then requires is a degree of animal testing, unfortunately, um, but still at the moment there aren't any accepted tests that can bridge what we can do in the lab and putting this into a, a, a human volunteer or a patient in a first test. So you still have to do standard safety tests in a rodent model 
and then a non-rodent large animal and there are specific batteries of tests depending what kind of drug if it passes through those then you can get potentially approval to go into either your patients or generally healthy volunteers first for the next level of safety testing so you would go in at very very low doses and escalate those and then if everything looks good safety and toxicity wise you could then progress to efficacy tests to see if there is any activity of the drug but until you get to the very final stages you would always be looking at safety first because something could still pop up in a larger study giving a higher dose etc so there are lots of steps to go through testing safety many more steps on that aspect than whether it works or not so it's always safety first does it work second and obviously you want the combination of both ideally and that's why making a drug takes so long so old classes of drugs so a typical um, small molecule medicine that Pfizer might get out of its big freezer with all its collection of molecules um, usually takes 12 years and 2.5 billion dollars from getting it out of the freezer to actually going through all of those lab tests, safety tests, clinical tests, and then it actually being on the shelf in a pharmacy. So 12 years, $2.5 billion. That's a lot of time and a lot of money. So Deborah, how is it then for this coronavirus that they say they're gonna get it out by the summer? So it's a fascinating one. And the same with Ebola. When there's an emergency, groups that have been working on these vaccines for a long time and it was the same with Ebola you had some amazing researchers out there that have been working on this but nobody's really bothered because it hasn't been a major health issue that process is now being fast-tracked under emergency measures um, where that will actually have to be trialed straight into patients um, basically on the point that those patients are likely not to survive anyway so you can accelerate drugs and this happened with the Ebola um, vaccine as well where if it's last line there's nothing else that you can give a patient regulators in a very controlled way will effectively allow a, a, a patient with that condition to be the, the safety subject and also the efficacy subject so it hasn't happened many times in history coronavirus as you say will be next um, we didn't have much luck with, with the H1N1 flu outbreak. There was never anything close to what we have for the coronavirus and then with Ebola. So in absolute emergencies, there are ways and means to accelerate things, but somebody has to have been researching it in the background in the first place, which is important. And thank goodness there have been some groups working on a coronavirus vaccine for a while. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, there's one down here and then back there. What kind of subjects did you enjoy in school and how did they relate to what you do now? What subjects did you enjoy at school, Deborah, and how did they relate to what you do now? Great question. So I did, uh, there's a bit of history about this. So um, I did biology, chemistry, physics, maths, English. Um, I dropped my humanities subjects, I absolutely love history and I love geography, but um, I'm showing my age here, but when I said to my chemistry teacher, I just dropped in before we started doing the equivalent of um, our hires that I wanted to do three sciences, because even though I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, I knew that it was something biologically science related and I would need um, chemistry for sure and likely physics. And he made the cop. Oh, I, I don't think you're cut out for doing um, three sciences, and that, that's quite unusual. The context was it was quite unusual for a girl to be doing it back then. Um, I went to my head of year and had a discussion about this, and she overturned um, his decision. So myself and uh, one of my friends actually both did three sciences. Um, I then studied those, the, the kind of A-level system in England um, and studied physics, chemistry and biology. Um, 
and those were absolutely directly applicable, especially initially the biology and the chemistry to the degree that I then did, which was biochemistry. And that's actually quite a, a broad biomedical science degree. Um, and I think it covers lots of subjects. One of them was immunology, and that's when I kind of started to fall in love with it. But it was a very, very good foundation biomedical science degree for me to do. Um, to this day, with the experiments that we do in the lab, physics absolutely applies to what we do. Biophysics is incredibly important. Um, things that weren't even subjects back then, so biostatistics, data management, all of that as well, absolutely directly applicable. Um, so it, it was sad to have dropped some of the subjects that were my second loves, but yeah, because I think I had a, a very science focused um, choice of courses anyway, it was very directly applicable to, you know, what I then did um, degree beyond and even to this day now. Thank you. Uh, there was somebody behind you. There you go. What was the biggest challenge that you faced in your career and how did you overcome it? What's the biggest challenge you've faced in your career so far, Deborah, and how did you overcome it? Oh, fabulous question. Um, do you know, nothing science related. One of the biggest challenges coming into the commercial space is finding the, the finance and the money to, to, to keep the business going and to invest because even though we're generating drugs that will not take 2.5 billion to get to market, this still does take a lot of money. Um, so coming out of an academic career, having to raise, and we've now raised just over 30 million pounds, that's a lot of money in 14 years. It's very hard work. And at the moment, believe it or not, even though there's a desperate, desperate need for new antibiotics, new antifungals, it's much easier to start a business and finance a business if you're working on a cancer therapy, if you're probably working on dementia at the moment. So it, it's the, the business aspect and raising the finance has been the, the challenging thing. How I guess I've overcome it is the science. Um, the data that we get day in, day out just shows how potentially amazing the, the medicines that we're developing can be. The clinical data that we have when you first do a, a clinical study and patients actually benefit, that's, I think, what keeps you going, helps you overcome it, helps you then be able to go back if you're having discussions with your investors, with funders, and actually show them good, solid data to say, you know, what we have have is great and potentially this is going to be a fantastic medicine and will make you a lot of money someday so although science has never been a challenge or the problem it has been part of how I and the, the company have, have overcome the commercial problems and challenges 